In my last video, I talked about a deadly virus that infects animals and humans, but in this video, we're going to talk about a different kind of virus. Sometime in October 1987, students at Hebrew University of Jerusalem started noticing odd things happening to their computer terminals. Spontaneous disconnections, slower speeds, and files growing in size for no apparent reason. Quite annoying, this wasn't a problem until files became so large they couldn't even be loaded into memory. Some programs even got data corrupted or failed to load altogether. It was eventually discovered by professors and students that this was a computer virus, a relatively new concept at the time. Students and researchers were both intrigued and concerned, but they knew something had to be done and quick. Little did they know though, the worst was yet to come. It is unknown exactly what happened, but in May of 1988, on Friday the 13th, the virus's payload was executed. Any program being ran that day would get completely deleted off the computer, a devastating blow to the user, but further led to serious real-world implications. The virus execution would go on to occur every subsequent Friday the 13th. Having many names, the virus was most commonly referred to as the Jerusalem virus. It is unknown exactly what individual or individuals created the Jerusalem virus, but it was speculated to be a direct attack towards the Hebrew University. The initial infection was aimed to wipe out the computer banks at the university, but would go on to have other serious real-world implications. Particularly, it was capable of corrupting, deleting, or changing almost any file on an array of different systems, including banking, healthcare, and even military. So how does this virus work? There's a great video I posted in the description showing how the virus works in action. The Jerusalem virus is a file injector and a logic bomb virus. To infect a computer, the virus must be loaded into memory, which at the time happened via floppy disk. Remember those? The virus plants itself somewhere into memory, where it resides, taking up 2 kilobytes in size. There are two files that the Jerusalem virus then goes on to infect, that being COM and EXE files. When you run COM files on an infected computer, the COM file will increase by 1813 bytes, where it is then infected. This is the virus injecting its code into the said file, hence the name File Injector. When you run an EXE file, the file will increase anywhere from 1808 to 1823 bytes, but there's a catch. Either a bug with the virus, or an intentional feature from its creator, the Jerusalem virus will constantly keep reinfecting the said EXE file until it is too large to fit into memory itself, which is what students in 1987 experienced. At this point, your computer will not work properly, in which running the EXE file will crash your entire terminal. Sometimes the virus will not properly infect an exe file initially, which causes the programs to fail as soon as it's executed. As the virus keeps injecting the code into the computer, the speed of the computer significantly decreases, which is one indication you might have the virus. As mentioned previously, there are two features of the virus. We have the virus adding its code into files, but we also have the virus executing its payload. The virus was never designed to execute payload in the year of 1987, but in 1988, presumably on May 13th, the virus pulled out its big guns. Any program ran that day would just be completely deleted off the computer. Gone. An indication that files were being deleted was an error message displayed by DOS after trying to execute the program. After running a program on an infected computer, an error message bad command or file name appears instead of bad command or file name. Notice the capitalization, where lowercase is the standard DOS response. Once the uppercase virus variant appears, the file is deleted off the computer. If the user were to reset DOS, it will no longer boot up properly, essentially rendering it useless. What damage did the virus do? There are not many records of the large-scale damage this virus did, but we know it made its way around the world. It was targeted at the university where it damaged thousands of computers, eventually affecting personal computers and businesses in many countries. It even wiped out almost half of a hospital's database. Concerns the virus would spread to banks and military systems arose, though no significant breach appeared to have occurred. What happened to the virus? Soon after the virus was discovered in 1987, select students began working on a quote-unquote cure, an antivirus. Nights were spent analyzing the Jerusalem virus, where the group of students finally found a way to detect and counter the virus. A counter program would scan the computer for infected files and essentially eradicate the virus from them. Word got around, and the students began handing this out around campus for free, before they figured they could market the program. Originally marketed under the name Anti-AIDS, the students were some of the earliest pioneers in the antivirus industry. 
Not everyone took advantage of this antivirus though, and many computers would go on to be infected in the years to come. With Jerusalem virus running on DOS terminals, the virus would eventually become obsolete with the introduction of the Windows operating system. The Jerusalem virus was a pivotal point for the rise of both computer viruses and antivirus software. Though we don't see Jerusalem viruses effect today, the struggle of viruses is a battle we are still fighting. Thank you for watching my video. For more content like this, subscribe to the channel and give me a very large thumbs up. Any suggestions for content, leave me a comment or email me at mt.caveat at gmail.com. Have a great day guys, and keep your computer healthy.